You know, right now in our society, it's like someone found the emotional dial and they took that emotional dial and they spin it all the way to the top. Because right now in our society, people are living with emotional levels that seem to be unequal to anything that I've ever seen. All I've ever done is pastor, and for 48 years, it's what I've done. But I've never seen a time where the emotions of people are at such a fevered pitch. In fact, it seems like that for a lot of people, they're just one thing from happening, and they will go over the step. They'll fall over that ledge. Just one thing. But there was a study that came out recently that devastated me as a pastor because I love my people the way Steve and Cindy love you. And I care for them and I'm passionate about them. But there's a generation called Gen Z. If you look at the Gen Z, for those of you that aren't uh, aware of it, it's ages 11 to 26. 11 to 26, right now, they say that 60% of that generation has anxiety disorder, 60%. It's never been in the history since man ever tracked emotional capacity that it's ever been there. So many of you that aren't in that generation, you're sitting there thinking, well, what does that mean? The average generation only has 20% of people that could be diagnosed with anxiety disorder. But this one generation, 11 to 26, 60% of them. And why is that? Because during COVID, they were asked to go to their room. They were asked to stare at a video. They were asked to learn online. They were told to stay there. They were told that people would be dangerous to them. And if they were near people, that it could cause something to happen to them. And they were told that. And for many of them, it wasn't a week. It wasn't a month. It was a year. It was two years. It was three years, and as a result of that, the time that they usually have to begin to develop relationship and behavioral skills, they were put behind, and then one day, people decided for their reason, it's all over, now you go out there. The very world that they were told that was scary, they were now sent into, and they were terrified. And as a pastor, I walk my auditorium like Pastor Steve does this one, and I pray, and God just keeps putting in my heart, I want to break the yoke of bondage. I want to break the yoke of bondage. I want to help that generation because they're dealing with trauma at a level. But see, it's not just that. I have 20 people in my church that are in their 70s. We've not been able to get out of their home since COVID started. The closest we can get to pastoring them, because we love those people, is for us to go stand at wherever the sidewalk is, let them come to their front porch and have a conversation from 20 to 30 feet away because they have been so occupied with a spirit of fear. There's never been a time that the emotional dial has been turned up and the intensity has been increased like it is today. Now, here's the thing about emotions. They're all a part of my life. They're a part of your life. But the thing about emotions is this. They can drive you places or they can guide you places. But you get to determine Are you going to be driven places by your emotions? Your emotions get the best of you and they drive you? Are they going to guide you? See, what emotions can do, they can take you places that you know you shouldn't go and they can keep you there longer than you should stay. And in this room right now, there are some people who know that they can be driven by their emotions to go places they shouldn't go. And for some, they've stayed there when they knew they shouldn't stay. But emotions can do that. They can compel you. And we look at people and say, why did you do what you did? That's not you. It's because emotions drive. But they can also guide. See, emotions can drive us to things. Our emotions can be what God attended. And they guide us in ways towards him. 
Now, here's what we know about people. Everyone in this room has their best emotion. Because of your personality, you have your best emotion. Everyone in here. For some of you, your best emotion is kindness. And man, does this world need that. You're just kind. You don't look at people as a threat. You don't think that everyone around you is a problem. You just look at them and you're kind. And you do some very unique things. You smile. Do you know how few people smile? Do you know how few people will look at someone and, and just smile at them? But they're kind people and we need you in our world because what kind people do is they smile. They not only smile, but they wave at people and they use all their fingers. <laughs> and that is needed. Just that, just that wave. But the other thing is, it's not only that they wave, but they say hi. I mean, remember when people used to say hi to each other, but now heads down. We don't say hi. We don't do that. I can remember um, a few years ago, I got these three wonderful kids. They're all grown. And the best thing about my kids, they all love God. But even more than that, uh, they've moved out of the house. Two things that every parent prays for. <laughs> that your kids will love God and leave. And so my, mine love God and, and, and they've moved out. But I had my oldest daughter years ago when she was in high school, she had to go to a doctor's appointment. Now you have to understand, and, and the community we live in in Texas, high schools are pretty big. And so she went to a high school that was just juniors and seniors and there were 7,000 students at it. So it's like walking on a campus. I mean, in Texas, we take high school seriously. We do them big. And so there's 7,000. So she went to a doctor's appointment, but kids are amazing. They had figured out how to counterfeit doctor's notes. And so if your kid said that they went to a doctor's appointment, a parent had to escort them back, go into the office, and validate it. Well, that day, I drew the short straw, and Jenny said, it's you. And so I'm taking my daughter back. We're walking across this campus. And I'm just being me. Someone walks by, you know, this kid, and I said, hi. Kid has his head down. Acts like I don't exist. Another kid walks by. I said, hi. Head down. Just keeps walking. Third kid comes by. I said, hi. Nothing. My daughter's behind me at a distance because she didn't want anyone to know she was connected to me. And so... <laughs> As a result of that, after the third one, my daughter says, Dad, what are you doing? And I said, sweetheart, I'm, I'm saying hi. And she said, we don't do that here. And I, I said, we don't say hi here? She said, no, we don't do that. And then she added these words. She said, and you're embarrassing me. Well, game on now. Because which parent doesn't want to embarrass their teenager? I mean, it is game on. I'm saying hi to everything now. Everything that comes by is a high moment. And so I'm just saying hi. People are walking by, walking by. And finally, I say hi. And this one young man stops and he says, hi. And he keeps walking after he says it. My daughter said, what just happened? And I said, sweetheart, I said, it's the law of giving. If you keep giving highs, eventually you get a high. <laughs> but see, some of you, you're just kind like that. You like waving at people. You like smiling. You like saying hi. And our world needs you. And that's your emotion. That's your dominant emotion. But here's the thing about every dominant emotion. It can also have a dark side to it. Because in the Bible, there was a lady named Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. And one day, Jesus came to their house, and when Jesus shows up at your house, he shows up with his posse. And so he's got all these guys with him that are rolling into this thing, 
and, and Martha goes into her kindness still, and she starts making sure that the food's right, and everything's everything, and making sure everyone's doing all right. But then she notices that Mary's not helping. And at first she doesn't say anything, but it starts bothering her. It starts bothering her. See, she's kind. But then she looks at Jesus and she says, but Jesus, don't you care that Mary's not doing anything? And Jesus has to talk to Martha. But here's the thing. See, kind people sometimes can become critical of people that don't process like them. And so they're saying, well, why isn't everybody else waving? And why isn't everyone else smiling? And why isn't everyone else expressing? So every emotion has a dominant side, but if you're not careful, it can have another side to it. Well, there's another Bible example of someone with big emotion, and and that was Peter. He was the bold person. He was the risk taker. You know the risk taker, the person that's always out there? They don't want a vacation where you just sit there and relax. They want an adventure vacation. Boy, they want to go places. I, I know the team at this church, and you guys have fabulous pastors at this church, but some of them, they have that kind of risk kind of thing. And I'm convinced, because you have Easter coming up, you may be the first church that has a thing called bungee baptisms. <laughs> because some of them are risk takers. You know bungee baptism, you take them up to the top of this dome, and then you tie something to them, and then you, you push them off and say, and then, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They go down and snap. They hit the water and pop back up, and you have a blow dryer waiting for them. <laughs> I can see it. Well, in the Bible, that person was Peter. Peter was a risk taker. He was always out there. So one night, when all the disciples are on a boat, And a storm's been brewing a little bit. They look out there and they see Jesus walking on the water. Now, I don't know about you. I'd be pretty content to watch Jesus walking on the water. But see, the risk taker isn't. Peter says, hey, Jesus, I want to walk with you. Now, you don't hear any of the other 11 saying that. That wasn't their personality. When I'm on Carnival Cruise Line, I like being on the boat. I'm not going to jump off of it. I'm not going to see if the water can sustain me. But what does Peter do? He gets out there. He's that person. He's got to do what no one else is doing. He's got to live on the edge of life. But the thing about bold and risk takers is sometimes there's a secret side to them. And so when Jesus is betrayed, Peter's hanging around watching the events, and there's a little girl who says, I think you've been with him. And he responds and says, no, I haven't. See, here's the thing about risk takers. They can still have secret fears. Things that sort of scare them. And that's where Peter was. But on the other end of the things, there's people like Elijah. Elijah had that that spirit of faith. Faith was natural to him. It came easy to him, where most of us sort of stumble into faith. Not Elijah. He was there. And so one day, he challenged some of the prophets of Baal to a contest, a God contest. And he said, you ask your God to burn up this altar down here. And then I'll ask my God. And Elijah's just watching this and And he starts getting sarcastic. He starts ridiculing them. And then it's his turn. He calls it down. and Fire comes down. It not only consumes the altar, but it consumes the prophets of Baal. Man, you talk about a faith moment. That's a church service I want to be at. Man, you know, pretty special service. God brought the heat that night. And so, all of a sudden, you're watching this, but then 
he leaves and he gets a little sticky note from a lady named Jezebel saying, hey, I heard what happened. I want you to know I'm going to kill you. Guy just called down fire from heaven. And what does he do? He's terrified. And he runs. Here's a man of faith who has moments of doubt. See, every emotion has a good side and it can have a dark side to it. And everyone in here, you have a dominant emotion. One of the reasons I love Steve is just for what he did just a minute ago. He said, I'm so glad that I'm the pastor of Legacy. I just want to thank all of you that have made Legacy great. I just want to thank you for all of you that serve. I want you to know that's important. I've never heard Steve that I didn't feel his heart of love for the people he pastors. I've never heard him. It's always there. And sometimes he talks all big and bad, but inside he's mushy. He's just got mush on the inside of him. I mean, he's like a Twinkie that got old. I mean, it's just there. But there it is. He's got a dominant emotion. It's in him. But here's the thing. When it comes to our emotions, God wants us to make sure that our emotions don't drive us, but they guide us. So what do you do when emotions attack you? When all of a sudden you're having a day when multiple emotions come your way? What do you do? Well, the Bible gives us an example of that happening. And the example is one of those examples that is pretty crystal clear. It's the example of Jesus, the night that he's going to be betrayed. See, Jesus knows what's coming, three and a half years of ministry, but now it's reaching a place where he knows that in a day he's going to be crucified. And so he asked his posse, he says, guys, would you come with me a little bit? And he says, we're going to come apart, and I need you. And we get the first indication that the weight of the cross was weighing on Jesus. Because you sense the loneliness. Jesus was feeling lonely. The Surgeon General of America about four months ago said the greatest epidemic in this nation right now is loneliness. The number of people who have profound loneliness in their life. And the thing about it is, is they said if you live with loneliness, it's equal to smoking 11 cigarettes a day, health-wise. Imagine that. You've never smoked but you feel isolated. You feel all alone. You don't think anyone notices. You don't think anyone cares. You're all alone. But that has a health effect. Science says this, that a person who lives in profound loneliness, they're 38 times more likely to die of anything. If I were to stand here and say, I'm going to give you a pill that will reduce cancer by 38%, that will reduce heart disease, diabetes, emphysema by 38%, if I were to do that, many of you would line up. But loneliness, it increases your likelihood. It increases your likelihood of having profound health problems. But this particular evening, Jesus felt lonely. The weight of everything was on him. He felt like nobody really understood, no one knew, but who could know? Who could understand what it's like to think that your mission in life isn't just caring for a mistake that one person made, but the mistakes that every person who's ever lived and would live made. Can you imagine the weight of that? See, some of you, you've had to work through and felt like you've had to live with the weight of someone else's mistake. And it weighed on you. I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I having to live through this? But can you imagine 
having the weight of every mistake that was ever on this planet, past, present, and future. Jesus felt all alone. He felt lonely. He wanted someone. That's the reason he asked him to go. He said, can you just come? See, one of the things about this church is they give you so many entry points, on-ramps, so you don't have to be lonely. They give you men's meetings. They give you ladies' meetings. They give you special. And people say, why are those important? Because you're fulfilling something that the Bible says you're to fill, fulfill, and that is that God did not create people to be alone. And so your darkest hour, Jesus still wanted people near him. And see, in your life and my life, there has to be that. But it wasn't just that. This loneliness was going to be so profound on him that he was going to begin to perspire, but it wasn't going to be just natural sweat. It was going to be blood because of the pressure and the strain. He felt lonely all alone. But it wasn't just that. He was going to have to deal with disappointment. Because as much as he knew, no one else could carry the weight of the cross. He had asked these men to be with him. And he said, could you just carry a little bit of this for a short period of time? And the way Jesus did it, he said, could you just pray with me for one hour? And so he went apart and he came back. And he didn't find them praying. He found them asleep. And he looked at them and he said, guys, couldn't you just pray? See, he didn't ask them to stay up all night like he was going to do. Just ask them for one hour. And how many of us have felt like the weight of everything was on us? And we just turned to people that we loved and said, could you just carry a little bit? We're not asking you to carry everything. Just carry a little bit of it. Just a little bit of it. And then we had to deal with the reality that many times they don't. And we live with that disappointment. Could you not just do a little? Jesus felt lonely. He felt disappointed. But it's even going to become more profound because there's going to be a group of people that are going to approach where they are. And when these people begin to approach where he is, there's going to be one person who's going to step out. And this is one of the individuals Jesus has spent three and a half years with. This man's going to leave the crowd and come up to Jesus and kiss him. Someone that Jesus had poured his heart in, had given his best to. This man's going to kiss him. He's going to have to deal with the hurt of people that you've helped. Not responding in help but responding with a level of darkness. And Judas is going to betray him. So in this one evening, he's going to face the loneliness of the weight what was coming, the disappointment of team members not being able to step up, and, and the feeling of someone that he had given his heart to and his life to that had just hurt him. He said it wasn't meaningful. But then... And I can't even imagine this. He's going to go through a trial. And this trial is going to be a speed trial. And finally, they're going to put him before the people. And they're going to say, there's two people up there. There's Jesus and there's Barabbas. You can choose which one gets set free. And everyone's going to holler Barabbas. Do you know what gets me about that? The same people that are saying, Barabbas, Jesus is going to die for. He's going to climb up a hill that he didn't have to climb up. He's going to carry a cross he didn't have to carry. He's going to be nailed on a cross that he didn't have to be nailed on. He's going to hang on a cross that he didn't have to hang on. And he's going to die on a cross that he didn't have to die on. For the people who said, we want you dead. 
Can you imagine the feeling of rejection? Jesus faced four emotions, loneliness, disappointment, hurt, and rejection. And those four emotions are emotions that all of us have to navigate. Now, none of us are going to face them to the dimensions that Jesus did, but all of us are going to be confronted with them. For some of you, loneliness is the big thing that you're feeling right now. For some of you, it's living with reoccurring disappointment. And for other people, it's dealing with the hurt of people and what they've done to you or didn't do for you. And for some of you, it's the rejection factor that you feel like everyone's turned their back. But Jesus is facing that. But in facing that, he gives us the template on how we respond when emotions can overwhelm us. So that we don't go over that edge. And he gives us three concepts on how we create healthy emotional management. And the first thing is this. We know that night that he went out there to, for a very specific purpose. He went out to pray. In fact, we know biblically he prayed three times. He separated himself three times. He prayed, and he's still struggling. And then he prayed again, and he's still struggling. And then he prayed again. And what Jesus knew was this. If you're going to manage the emotions that come at you in life, your prayers have to be bigger than your feelings. Your prayers have to be get bigger than your feelings because your feelings will get to you and your prayers have to be bigger than that. See, I pastor, it's all I've ever done. But I stand at the back door of the church, people come by me, and people are sincere and they're happy, you know, to, to be out at church. But then when they come by and you're the pastor, sometimes you have conversations like this. Hey, pastor, I just want to tell you what I'm going through. I need to tell you what I'm facing. I need to tell you what I'm feeling. And see, every pastor is gracious in those moments because we pastor. But sometimes, when you've pastored like I have, the church that I pastor for 42 years, I've heard the same people come and say the same thing. And occasionally, when they've done it so repetitively, I just look at them and I said, I know you want to talk to me about what you're feeling, but I just need to know, have you talked to God more than you've talked to me? And they'll just sort of look at me and say, well, you're my pastor. And I said, I am your pastor, but I'm not God. And I'm limited. See, when you tell me what you're feeling, you know what the best I can do? I'm so sorry. But too many people talk about what they're feeling more than they pray to God about what they're feeling. And see, if you don't pray to God about what you're feeling more than you talk to anyone else, your feelings are going to overwhelm you. Someone says, well, what does prayer do? Well, one, it creates perspective. And people say, well, what do you mean it creates perspective? It reminds you that there is a God and it's not you. And that perspective comes. But there was a second thing that was going to go on there. And the second thing that was going to go on there was his love for his father. Because he's going to pray the same thing. He's going to say, Lord, not my will, but your will. He's being honest. He says, God, if there's a plan B that we can take care of sin, if there's some way we can do this without me carrying that cross, going up on that cross, dying on that cross, let's do that. Is there any other way? But here's the thing. He said, but God, above all, I want your will. His love for God was bigger than his feelings. Now, what I know about everyone in this room is this. Everyone in this room has something to be mad about, and you have something to be sad about. Everyone in here, there's something. Man, if you knew what happened to me, you would be mad too. Everyone in here, you have it. You know what that is in your life. You know, and you have something to be sad about. If you went through what I went through, but I know people who've let their madness and their sadness 
become bigger than their love for God. And here's how I know it. There's some people, if you took away them being angry, they wouldn't even have a personality anymore because it's all they've ever been. Nobody's ever known them when they weren't mad. It'd be like, hey, if you took away madness from them, who in the world, what in the world would they be? Your love for him needs to be bigger than anything you're mad about down here. And your love for him needs to be bigger than anything you're sad about down here. And if you don't let your love for him where you'll say, God, man, I'm telling you honestly, this is what I feel, but above all your will, because I love you, and I want to be pleasing to you, and I want to do what's right in your eyes, I want to do that. If you don't have that in your heart, your emotions will eat you alive. And it doesn't matter how time, how many times you come to your pastor. Your prayers have to be bigger than your feelings. And your love has to be bigger than your feelings. But there was a third thing, and that was your faith has to be bigger than your feelings. See, the one thing that Jesus hints everything on was he said, God, if there's not any other way, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you that even though this way doesn't make any sense and I don't feel like doing it and I don't want to do it, I trust you and I will do it. So is your faith bigger than your feelings? I can remember when Mother Teresa, and she was a hero of mine, and I can remember when she died. She had built this amazing organization that that helped dying people, that helped orphans, that helped hurting people, it helped everybody. But when she died, they published her memoirs, and her memoirs honestly talked about times when she felt like she didn't even know that God existed. And everyone that didn't know God said, oh, see, she didn't believe there was a God. But here's what they didn't know. Being a person of faith doesn't mean that you don't have questions. I've never met a person of faith that didn't have questions. I've stood at the back door of my church and people have come up to me and made statements like this who visit the church and say, Pastor, if you'll answer this question why this happened, I'll believe. And I just look at them, I said, if I could answer your question, I have a whole list of them that I'd answer first. And they just looked stunned. I said, do you think I don't have questions? See, faith isn't the absence of questions. It's just believing and trusting that God's bigger than any question that you have. There's a man named Dallas Willard. He's since gone home to be with Jesus, but he was the, um, the dean of philosophy out at USC. And he was a brilliant thinker. But young people would come out there and they would debate their faith with him. They would have these conversations and Dallas Willard would look at them and he says, here's the one thing I want to encourage you to do. Doubt your doubts as much as you want to doubt your faith. He says, your doubts aren't any more fact. He said, faith is a choice that you believe that there's a God and ultimately He's going to accomplish his will if you put your life in his hands. So here's what I know. The emotional level of our society is greater than it's ever been. Some of you, you're one event from being the next news story that we hear. And you know that. You know that anger can push you to do things and say things. You know that the sadness could cause you to do something. You know that. But we come to church and we act like all is well. And it may be with our soul, but it's not with our lives. Here's the thing about that. 
If you're going to manage emotions in this world, you better have prayers that are bigger than your feelings. You better be talking to God more than you're talking to anyone else. And your love for God and what he wants to do in your life better be bigger than anything you feel. And your faith in God better be bigger than anything you feel. Because if that got Jesus to the cross, I don't know what your problems are, but you're not having to walk up a hill. You're not having to carry a cross. You're not about to be nailed to it, and you're not about to hang in it. You're not about to die on it. You're not about to be put in a tomb carrying the weight of the world. He did. And if it got him through, it's what gets us through. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, right now, I pray that that you would do what only you can do. Lord, I can give information, but you're the only one that can create transformation. See, in this room, you know the person who's lonely. In this room, you know the person who is disappointed. In this room, you know the person who's hurting. And in this room, you know the person who's dealing with rejection. And I'm asking that you would minister to them and you would help them. Three questions before we go any further. First question is this. Do you have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what I'm not asking. I'm not asking if you're a member of this church. I'm not asking if you're a member of my church. I'm not asking if you've gone through confirmation. I'm not asking if you've gone through dedication. I'm not asking if you've been water baptized. I'm not asking if you've been christened. I'm asking a simple question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus so you know that if you were to die today, when you close your eyes here, you would open your eyes next up there? If you don't know that, you can, because the Bible says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. Second question. Maybe you would say, I'm a person of faith. I believe in Jesus. Then are you close to him? See, a lot of people believe in Jesus, but they're not close to him. Life comes in and circumstances come in and schedules come in and all these things come in and they get in the way. Are you close to him? Jesus didn't come into your life to be a part of your life. Jesus came into your life to be the center of your life. So if you're not close to him tonight's the night, I want to pray with you. But if you can say you're a person of faith and you can say you're close to him, then the third question, have you ever been filled with the Spirit like it talks about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 where it says, and they were all filled with the Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, the New Testament is based on two promises. The promise of Jesus That secures your future. But the promise of the Holy Spirit, that gives you power to live for today. And a lot of people have a secure future. They've just never accepted the power of God to live for today. And you need it. So three questions. Do you know him? Are you close to him? And if you can say yes to those two, have you been filled with the Spirit by him? If you haven't. I want to pray for you. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around, in any one of those three areas, you know I'm talking to you, I need you to raise your hand because I want to pray with you. I see that hand. 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 I see that hand, 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 I see that hand. If you haven't raised your hand up to now and you want to be a part of this prayer, I need you to raise your hand right now. I see that hand, 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 I see that hand. Now here's the thing, I want to pray with you but I need to pray for you the way God wants me to pray for you. And what that means is I'm gonna ask you to be uncomfortable. And that's gonna mean that I'm gonna ask you to stand from wherever you are and to come down here because I wanna pray for you down here. So if you raised your hand, you don't worry about mama, you don't worry about daddy, 
the girlfriend, the boyfriend. You don't worry about who your friends are. You stand up and you come down here right now because I want to pray for you. We've got time. You come down here. You come down here. We've got time. Take your time. I know coming down those stairs isn't always easy. Thank you. You're so kind. You're so kind. Thank you. Thank you. Now, no, you, you down here, I need you to look at me. Please, please look at me. Jesus loves you so much. He loves you so passionately. He loves you so much. What we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer that's going to do one of three things. If you don't know him, you're going to get to know him. If you know him, but you're not close to him, you're going to get close to him. But if you know him and you're close to him and you want to get filled with the Spirit, you'll be filled with the Spirit tonight. Now, let me talk to those of you out here. Nobody paid a cover charge to come in here. Church is never a spectator sport. One of two things is happening. You're either receiving in faith, which these people are, or you're helping someone receive in faith, which is what you're going to do. So I'm going to ask you to stretch your hands towards them, and I'm going to ask you to pray with them as they reach out. And then we're going to tell them what next looks like. Everyone in here, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, you said in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I would be saved. Today I'm doing that. I believe with all my heart that you are my Lord. Therefore, I thank you for saving me and changing my life forever in Jesus' name. And today, Lord, I'm asking you to fill me with the Holy Spirit and to give me my heavenly prayer language. And I believe today you're filling me because you said, if I ask, I will receive in Jesus' name. Amen.